Well, welcome to Bear Creek Baptist Church on Palm Sunday. It is uh, kind of a strange season of the year, isn't it? Who would have ever thought that on Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we would uh, not be able to gather together. But uh, we can be together in our hearts and in our minds, and hopefully this uh, video will, uh, will help bring us all together in one spirit. And uh, it's very, very strange speaking to basically an empty room, but uh, <clears throat> I know that, uh, that I'm, I'm not speaking to this room. I'm speaking to you, and I'm speaking to my own self. I'm speaking to my family and to all of the Bear Creek family. So uh, I just welcome you today. This, uh, this uh, unusual time of, uh, in, in our country, in our lives, in our world, has all of us in a, a different kind of state than we've been in in the past. We're all in prayer. We're all praying for God to, to uh, overcome this virus quickly and to get us back to where we can meet and greet and hug and enjoy being together again. So today I welcome you to, um, to Bear Creek Baptist Church. And I want to encourage you, if you're a member of this church, don't forget... Uh, about your offerings. I'm going to sound like a television preacher here for a minute since I'm on television, I guess. <clears throat> I just want to encourage you to, uh, to send your offerings in, your tithes and offerings, and don't forget about our uh, Annie Armstrong offering. Uh, you see uh, in the background, you see the, the address of our church, 1810. That is actually our goal for our Annie Armstrong offering this year. So let's make sure that we get those in by next Sunday, if at all possible, by Easter Sunday, and then we'll be able to send those in to our denominational office. So I want us to, uh, to worship the Lord today. And during this time, uh, there are a lot of things that God's been teaching me, a lot of things that he's been teaching each of us, I believe. And one of the things that he's been showing me is how important it is for me to draw close to him, to really, really spend time loving him and seeking his face. Several times this week I've come across verses where it talks about seeking the Lord's face. And that's what I want us to do right now as we pray. And then we're going to, to worship and, and just look into his face as we sing and as we worship the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word tells us to, to seek your face. And I know it's so easy for us to want to seek your hands, to seek what you can do for us. But really, I want us to, uh, I want us to seek you for who you are, not for what you can do for us. And I know the, uh, uh, Job in, uh, in his book said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I want us, as your children, to be able to say whatever situation we find ourselves in, like the Apostle Paul said, in whatever state I am, I want to be content. I want to be able to worship you and praise you. So today, as we uh, worship without being in the same room, we know that we are in one spirit. And I just ask you, Father, to uh, help us lift up our songs of praise and worship and to honor you as we join our hearts our voices together in Jesus' name. Amen. The large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they came with branches and palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your King is coming, sitting on a donkey's head.
John chapter 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. in our congregation, and I know there are so many in the health care service that are just working themselves day in and day out to try to meet the needs that are so important right now. So we just uh, say thank you to all of those, also our first responders. I talked to our police chief here in Glen Heights this week, and he said they are really stretched, and, 
And so, uh, just a, a special word of gratitude to all of those who are working just extra hard during this time of uh, this uh, pandemic that's going around. So, uh, this is Palm Sunday, and uh, Simon has already read to you a passage out of John's Gospel about the, what we call the triumphal entry. But I want to read Matthew's account of it. It's recorded in all four of the Gospels. But in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, it says, Now when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt, and they put on them their cloaks, and Jesus sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It's an amazing uh, passage of Scripture, all of these passages describing what's coming to be the climax of the life of Jesus. What, from an earthly perspective anyway, all of his ministry, he has been moving toward this particular event. In fact, the Bible tells us several times that Jesus would say to his disciples, uh, the Son of Man must go to the city of Jerusalem, and there he's to be rejected by the scribes and the Pharisees. He's to be mistreated, ill-treated, and that he will be crucified and then on the third day, he will rise again. Somehow or another, the disciples, even after hearing that over and over and over again, don't tell it how many times, we have it recorded at least three times in the Gospels that he told them that, but uh, he may have said it many more times than that, but somehow or another, it just went right over their head, and they just thought, well, I, I don't know what he means by that. And uh, so somehow they were not expecting what was going to happen. In fact, they seem to have had the same attitude and the same mindset that the people there in Jerusalem had. I want you to know that 63 years before the birth of Jesus, the Romans conquered Jerusalem. They destroyed the city. They, they took over the city in just about every way possible, and, uh, and, and it ended the independent rule that Israel had had for a little while. And now they, the Romans were, you know, we hear about the iron heel of Rome. Well, they really had come down with their iron heel as they were, uh, had subjugated the Jewish people. They had raised the taxes. They had just made life miserable for them. So for almost 100 years, 95 years, the, the Jewish people had been under the uh, control of the very, very harsh and demanding Roman Empire. And uh, uh, the, nobody probably was, was alive at the time of Jesus that remembered Israel being free. They had all grown up under the, the tyranny of Rome. And there had began to be this dream that had they, as they looked back and they studied all the ancient scriptures, they saw that, that there was a promised deliverer, that someone would someday come and set them free. And uh, they spoke of this. Uh, they, they found lots of verses in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. They would have just called it their scripture. 
And they found prophecies uh, about this coming Messiah. And they were excited. And then as John the Baptist, about three years earlier, had begun to baptize and had begun to announce that the kingdom of God was coming and Jesus himself had begun to perform miracles and teach teachings, that the hope was rising and rising and rising in their hearts. And maybe, maybe this is the one that we've waited for. And I just want you to know that the entire Bible is about Jesus. I mean, from the very opening pages, uh, we read that God had made a promise after Adam and Eve sinned that there would be one born of the woman who would crush the head of the tempter and of the serpent of Satan. And so all through the law, all through the prophets, all through the Old Testament as we know it, there was this promise after promise after promise that the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. And there have been a few times over the years when they thought, well, maybe this one, maybe this is the one. But always they would be disappointed. But now their hopes were high. And uh, word certainly had gone out that here was a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who had been teaching like nobody that they had ever heard. As a matter of fact, when we read his teachings in the Bible, they would say no one ever taught like this man. And then he did things that nobody had ever done. He uh, healed the sick. He delivered people from captivity. He uh, healed lepers, people who were lepers. And uh, you talk about social distancing. You know, uh, in that day, uh, a person who had leprosy didn't have to worry about social distancing. Everybody distanced themselves from him. But the Bible tells us that a leper came to Jesus, and while he was still far off, he, he cried out and he said, Lord, if you will, I know you can heal me. And the Bible says that Jesus went up to him and Jesus touched him. That's just amazing to me. It's a very, uh, very emotional moment. Can you imagine this, this man who had not had a human touch since, uh, since he had contracted leprosy? We don't know how long that had been. But the Bible says that Jesus touched him. And actually, the word for touch there is a, a very intimate word. It's a word that means more like an embrace. Jesus gave him a hug. And, uh, and then Jesus said, I, I will. And he healed the man of his leprosy. And the disciples and all the people who heard about it were absolutely astounded. And certainly the word went all out everywhere. Here is a man who does what no one else has ever done. Here's a man who teaches in a way that no one else has ever taught. Could this be the Messiah? And then in addition to that, Jesus began to speak of himself in messianic terms. He called himself the son of David. He called himself the son of man. And all both of those are messianic terms. And so it's almost as if he were wearing a name badge saying, I am the Messiah. And when he was asked point blank by the woman at the well in the Gospel of John, and she said, uh, uh, we know that when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. He'll make things right. And then Jesus said, the one who is speaking to you right now is the Messiah. I am the Messiah. So Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. And so we read in this particular account, the day came. It was approaching Passover weekend, and, and the, the day came when Jesus instructed his disciples to go and make everything ready for my entrance into the city. Go and make everything ready for, for my coronation, in a sense. And so the disciples must have been absolutely out of their mind with excitement. And they were so thrilled and and he told them to go into the city and uh, into the village and, and uh, you'll find a donkey. Somehow or another, Jesus had arranged all this. And, uh, and he said, bring that donkey to me and then I will ride into the city. Now, this is significant because in, the, in biblical days, when a warrior came into a city and he came in to conquer the city, he came in usually on a, a stallion of some kind, some kind of large white horse that would de declare that he was in charge. 
But if a, if a ruler were to come in on a donkey, this would mean that he was coming in peace. And so Jesus said, bring that donkey to me. And they did. And the Bible says that the disciples, they, put their, they took their cloaks off, laid it on the donkey, and Jesus began to ride into the city. And I can only imagine the excitement that must have been gripping everybody. And there was a, just a word going all over the city that Jesus is coming. He's coming into the city. He's coming in in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. He's riding on a donkey. He is, he's coming in. And the, even the children, the Bible says, begin to sing praises to him. And the men and the women, they begin to throw their cloaks down on the ground so that he could walk on them. And then they cut down palm branches and laid them down and as Jesus came in they began to shout Hosanna, Hosanna this is a word that means save now Lord now is the time for our salvation their, their deliverer, deliverer they thought had come and they were so excited and, uh, and they said blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord by the way just a hundred and 90 years or almost 200 years prior to that, uh, the, the Jews had been delivered from a Syrian, uh, a Syrian, occupation, uh, a Syrian occupation by the uh, Maccabees. And uh, when Judas Maccabees rode into the city, that's exactly the same thing they said back then. They said, uh, Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So their history seemed to be repeating itself as they thought, now our king has come, our deliverer has come, our Messiah has come, our Savior has come. And so Jesus entered the city with all of those accolades, all of the people praising him, and then they said, who, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, as I, as I read through this this week, I saw several things. Number one, that Jesus was in total control of the whole situation. He knew everything that was happening. He had everything planned and prepared. And by the way, do you know that he has everything planned in your life and in my life? We may feel like things are out of control. We may say, well, our, our government's out of control. Our finances are out of control. Uh, uh, Health-wise, we're out of control. But I tell you, it's not out of God's control. He is in charge right now. And nothing has taken him by surprise. And there is no virus, there is no disease of any kind that he is not Lord and Master over. So here he was in total control. And he was fulfilling prophecies, prophecies that had been given uh, uh, 300, 400 years earlier, 500 years earlier by the prophet Zechariah saying that the Messiah would come riding on a donkey and that he would come and be blessed and uh, uh, they, they would be crying out to him, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus is fulfilling, by the way, he fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. It's interesting to me that the Bible, the Christian faith, is the only faith in all the world, it's the only religious uh, faith that, uh, that has fulfilled prophecy. None of the other people would, be, uh, would, would dare risk making detailed prophecies of things that were going to happen because they would have no way of knowing. All it would take would be just for one thing not to happen that they said was going to happen, and they would be declared a false prophet. But Jesus made dozens, uh, and, and the Old Testament made hundreds of prophecies about the coming Messiah, both his first coming and his second coming. And Jesus himself made many prophecies concerning the future. And, uh, of course, all of the ones that, uh, that were made concerning Jesus, they were all fulfilled, literally. Even this one, I mean, who could have ever known 400, 500 years before Jesus was even born that he would come as the Messiah riding on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem? It's just amazing. And it's just, we, I could take a long, long time to talk about dozens, um, really hundreds, of other fulfilled prophecies regarding 
the life of Jesus. I mean, you just read uh, Psalm 22 and um, Isaiah 53, and you, you'd think you were reading a description of an eyewitness who was standing at the cross, and these were written uh, a thousand years or 800 years before Jesus was even born. So I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm just saying that, that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy uh, like he had done repeatedly. In fact, when, uh, uh, when Jesus brought his first message, his inaugural message, you might say, he quoted from the book of Isaiah saying that he had come. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to, and he gave pretty much his, the description of, of what his ministry was, and it was to set the captives free, to set at liberty those who were enslaved, and to proclaim the, the, the jubilee year of the Lord. And he, he came to do all of those things. So uh, he, he came in fulfillment of prophecy. But then also, he, he comes in an unexpected way. I'm sure that when the people saw him riding into the city on the donkey, saying that he's coming as a, a, a prince of peace, some of them must have thought, well, th this must be a trick, or I must be misunderstanding, because we don't need a prince who's bringing peace. We need a warrior who is bringing deliverance. And so they're, they're, uh, they were concerned because he, he came in an unexpected way. And he's welcome as a Messiah, but... But it's a Messiah to defeat Rome. They saw that their greatest need was to be free from Roman rule. So, so when, when Messianic hope began to grow, they were thinking, uh, we need a Messiah who will, who will deliver us from our enemies and who will conquer the Roman officials and drive out the Roman legions and give us independent rule again in our land. And uh, his true identity was missed. They, uh, they didn't understand who he was. You know, even his disciples didn't understand it. We see it just repeatedly. Jesus, on one occasion, when he said that he had to go into Jerusalem and there he was going to die, <coughs> uh, and now on the third day be raised again, Simon Peter, his chief apostle, took him aside, it says, and he said to him, Not so, Lord, not so, Lord. This could never happen to you. By the way, that's a those are those are two phrases you can never use together. You can never say not so and Lord. I mean, you say yes, Lord, but you don't say no, Lord. Because uh, when Jesus said, here's the way it's going to be, you just say, yes, yes. But Simon Peter didn't understand it. The disciples didn't understand it. They had their head filled with this idea that he was coming to bring uh, uh, freedom from Rome. And by the way, we know this is true because many of the people in that very crowd, and this was on Palm Sunday, this was one week before Jesus was to be crucified the, the next week. And uh, it, it was on the Sunday before he was to die the next week. And just within the next few days, he would be arrested, he would be tried, falsely tried, falsely accused, taken from trial to trial to trial, and then he would be uh, horribly uh, uh, treated, mistreated, and then crucified. And uh, this... Uh, Many of the people who were in this crowd that were saying, hail him, hail him, within five days, they were saying, nail him, nail him. And it just shows how fickle our human heart can be. It shows just how, how we can so quickly and so easily misunderstand what God's purposes are in our life. And so... As I look through this, this story, seeing those particular things that I've just mentioned, uh, the, the thoughts hit me that he is still in control. He is in control. And he knows exactly what the past has been, 
but he also knows what the future will be. He knows the future as well as we know the past and the present. He is still in control. And he is still presenting himself to us as the Savior. Jesus said the Son of Man has not come to be served, but he has come to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And I just want you to know, Jesus does not come to satisfy the human carnal needs that we demand. One of the greatest dangers, I believe, that people face today, in, especially in our own country, is that we have kind of an idea that God ought to bless us the way we want to be blessed and not necessarily bless us with the blessings that he desires to give to us. It's uh, starting back in the 1980s, there began to be an increasing uh, teaching on uh, uh, prosperity and wealth and there began to be this idea that if, if you if you trust in God if you trust in Jesus he will be your uh, financier he will be your banker he will be your doctor he will see to it that nothing bad happens in your life and of course many of those who were preaching that back in the 80s they got sick and then they went broke, many of them. So I mean, even went to jail. But, uh, 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 and, and it's confusing today to some people because they say, well, I, I thought that's what Jesus wanted, that he wants to bless me. Well, that's what these people thought in that day. They thought, well, how can this be our Messiah if he's not going to do things the way we want him to? Well, it's just, that's just the point. The Messiah does things the way he wants to do it not the way we want him to do it. And so these people rejected him because he did not meet their personal expectations. And there are still many, many people today who want to welcome Jesus as their helper. They want to welcome Jesus as their blessor. They want to welcome Jesus as the one who will provide for them everything that they want and everything they need. But then they reject him as the Savior from sin. And listen, in fact, I just want to get kind of close to you here today. And I want to tell you, Jesus did not can't come to save you from sickness. The fact is, we are going to get sick. We, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray when we're sick. I do pray when I'm sick. But I realize that there is a sickness that leads to death. And I need to accept that. I need to know that. And even if I don't know exactly which one it is, and that's the reason that I can pray when I'm sick. But Jesus did not come mainly to save me from sickness. He didn't come to save me from poverty. I praise God for the, the fact that God has provided my needs all along, uh, all, all through my ministry, all through my life. I've never had what you'd call abundance, but I've always had a sufficient amount. Like the Apostle Paul said, I've learned to, uh, to praise him when I have plenty and when I don't have much. But God did not come primarily, Jesus did not come to save me from poverty. There are many devout, beloved, wonderful Christian people who are living in abject poverty in many parts of our world today. And their faith is greater than mine. Their faith may be greater than just about anybody in America. So Jesus did not come to save us from poverty. Uh, from, from physical, material struggles. Jesus said, I have come to save you from sin. When, uh, when the angel announced the, to, the name that Jesus would be given, he said, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. And I just want to tell you today, just, just draw up close for just a minute. I just want to tell you, your greatest problem is not the coronavirus. 
Your greatest problem is not your shrinking uh, finances or stocks and bonds and things like that. Your greatest problem is sin. Hey, here's the truth. The Bible says that all of us have sin. Listen, when God created the world and he created the Garden of Eden and he placed man in that garden, there were two trees in that garden right in the center of the garden along with the hundreds of other trees that they could eat from. And in the midst of that garden, there was the tree of life, the tree of life. They never ate of that tree. That was the tree, basically, of absolute, total acceptance and dependence upon God. But also there was another tree, and it was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was the tree of independence. It was the tree by which man could say, no, we will make our own decisions, but it actually was the tree of death. So there were two trees. There was the tree of life. There was the tree of death. We know the story. They chose the tree of death, and they ate of that tree, and the Bible says that in the day that they ate of it, they died. God had said, in the day you eat of that tree, you will die. Now, they didn't fall over dead physically, but they did die spiritually. And then all of their progeny, all of their sons and daughters, and all of their grandsons and granddaughters, and all the way down to our very day, were born with that uh, uh, death in us. The Bible says that uh, in the book of Ephesians, you who were dead in trespasses and sin, God has made alive. So here's the situation. All have sinned. You have sinned. I have sinned. Every person on this planet has sinned. The only sinless person was a person who was not born of the seed of Adam, and that was Jesus. And all have sinned. All we like sheep have gone astray, the Bible says. Now, here's the fact. You say, well, well, you know, if everybody sins, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. The big deal is that the wages of sin is death. You say, well, I thought you said we were already dead. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the spiritual death, but it is not the ultimate death. The ultimate death is to die without receiving life and to go into eternal punishment separated from God forever. And so all have sinned. All have gone their own way. And the Lord has laid upon him, upon Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Listen, there, Jesus came. He came riding on this donkey, and he, he went to that cross. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And, and Jesus gave his life to pay for my sin and for your sin. You know, there's, there's two real dangers that I run into as I talk to people, share the gospel, the good news with them, that Jesus died for their sin and he rose again from the grave. There are some people who say, oh, oh my sin is way too great. I, I, I couldn't, God couldn't forgive me. I've, I, I've, I've done too many bad things. No, do you know that Jesus said, you know, the people who are well, they don't even need a doctor. But he said, those who are sick, they're the ones I've come for. And in Jesus' ministry, the people that he associated with were the people who were the outcasts from the religious crowd. In fact, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. And I'm telling you, there is no sin too great, there is no sinner too great that Jesus cannot forgive and that Jesus doesn't love. So that's one, that's one group of people, the people who say, well, well I, I'm not, I, I, I just don't believe I can be saved because I've been so bad. Good news, Jesus came to save really, really bad people. But then there's another group, and that's the group that says, well, you know, I, I hadn't been that bad. 
I've actually lived a pretty clean life. I've done pretty well. And uh, I don't think I even need a Savior. Well, that group, by the way, is really in greater danger than the first group. That group, they're the ones who don't realize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Oh, I appreciate the fact that there are people who live decent lives. They're good neighbors. They uh, are good citizens. They're good patriots. Uh, maybe even they're good churchmen. But if they don't know Jesus, if they haven't trusted him, then their goodness actually becomes a barrier to his grace. Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say the worst form of badness is human goodness when it substitutes for the new birth. And I'm telling you today, whether you're the worst of the worst or you think you're the best of the best, Jesus loves you and you need Jesus. And uh, when somebody says to me, well, you know, I, 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 think I've got, I think I've got it pretty well. My life's doing okay. And, and, and I've had people say to me, well, you know, uh, uh, I think religion is just a crutch. Hey, crippled people need crutches, don't we? Yeah, nobody should make, you, you, don't, you don't make fun of somebody if you see them walking with a crutch. And I'm telling you, you need a crutch. You need more than a crutch. You need a Savior. And Jesus came riding into that city, declaring himself to be the promised one that God had said was coming. And he comes today saying to you and to me, what will you do with me? And you say, well, I'm going to throw my cloak down on the ground and I'm going to sing and I'm going to say, Hosanna, Hosanna. That's great. Do that. But do more than that. And when somebody says, who is he? You better say much more than, well, he's the prophet from Nazareth. No, he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the Lamb of God that takes away our sin. And I just plead with you today. If I could just sit down right next to you there on your couch or wherever you are and just look right into your eyes and just say, please, please, turn from sin, turn from self, turn from pride, turn from, from depend, self-dependence and cry out to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, please save me. Save me right now. And the wonderful news is the Bible said whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that a glorious promise? And we read earlier today, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. He loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life, eternal life. And you have the opportunity today to eat of that tree of life and receive Jesus as your Savior. Would you pray a prayer like this just right now, right there where you are? Would you just, just cry out to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that I have fallen short of what you've called me to. And I realize that the wages of sin is death. That what I deserve is death but I thank you Lord Jesus that you took my death you died in my place and right now I receive you by faith I receive you to be my Savior my Messiah my Lord to save me from sin in Jesus name Amen now if you prayed that prayer today I hope that you did. I just want to ask you to uh, to let me know. Would you do that? 
my uh, my email address is ovilla nick at yahoo.com ovilla nick at yahoo.com and if you just send me an email and just say uh brother nick i i heard the message today and i i trust in trusted jesus today and if you'll do that and send me a return uh, how to how to get back in touch with you i will con- i will do that and uh and even now even as we're closing this service i just ask you to uh to make certain that you are trusting only only in jesus don't trust in your religion many of the pharisees were doing that don't trust in your good works It's wonderful to have good works, but they have to follow salvation. They never lead to salvation. Don't trust in your family connections. You don't trust in the fact that your parents were Christians. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Thank you so much for listening today. We just have a a closing prayer, and then uh, we're going to sing one closing hymn. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you now in Jesus' name to confirm into the hearts of those who have prayed this prayer today that you are indeed their Savior. And I pray that as their life changes, as they begin to see and sense your Spirit working in them, living in them, that they will be able to say confidently and certainly, I have received Jesus. For it's in his name. I pray.